Welcome to the Christ Community Church Sermon of the Week. We are so glad that you've tuned in. It is our prayer that as we preach the Bible, the Holy Spirit would speak to you and that your eyes would be fixed on Jesus. We hope you enjoy. Okay. And I am reading our scripture today. It's coming from Acts 5, 32. No, 33. When they heard this, they were enraged and wanted to kill them. But a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law, who was respected by all the people, stood up in the Sanhedrin and ordered the men to be taken outside for a little while. He said to them, men of Israel, be careful about what you're about to do to these men. Some time ago, Theudas rose up claiming to be somebody, and a group of about 400 men rallied to him. He was killed, and all of his followers were dispersed and came to nothing. And after this man, Judas, the Galilean, rose up in the days of the census and attracted a following. He also perished, and all his followers were scattered so in the present case, I tell you, stay away from these men and leave them alone. For if this plan or this work is of a human origin, it will fail. But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. You may even be found fighting against God. They were persuaded by him. So after they called in the apostles and had them flogged, they ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus and release them. Then they went out from the presence of the Sanhedrin, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to be treated shamefully on behalf of the name. Every day in the temple and in various homes, they continued teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. Thanks be to God. Amen. All right. Well, once again, good morning, Christ Community Church. If we've not had the pleasure of meeting, my name is Josh, and I get the honor and privilege of being the senior pastor here at CCC. And I am just excited because Jesus, the light of the world, is here with us today. And if you are new here, um, I just want to say welcome. Uh, we are glad that you are here today. And uh, it's church family, for all those that are new in the house, let's give them a round of applause. We are thankful that you are here today. <laughs> and we would uh, love to know that you are here. And a great next step for you is after our gathering today to stop out at the connection desk and fill out a connect card and uh, turn that into our team, and they're going to give you a gift in return. Uh, but before we dive into the Word today, we want to celebrate, and today, probably already guessed what we're going to celebrate. We are going to celebrate all the mothers in the house today. Happy Mother's Day. Let's give it up for all the moms. Um, I know I'm so thankful to have my mom with us today, uh, which she's, this is our church home now. Um, and then I'm also thankful for my beautiful wife on the front, uh, she's the best mom to our children. I love this quote by Charles Spurgeon. He once said, Never could it be possible for any man to estimate what he owes to a godly mother. And for all the mothers here today, we have a, a small gift for you uh, when you leave. Um, just out in the foyer, you'll get those handed out to you. And we hope that your day is filled with joy and that you would feel the love of God today. And we love and appreciate all of the moms in the house. And to continue the celebration of Mothers, I want to celebrate our Mother's Day luncheon yesterday. Uh, we had around 90 women in attendance, and all the women had a great time. Uh, here at CCC, something we do, uh, we gather and we have fellowship, and we also serve, but we have fellowship, and the women had a great time of uh, fellowship. And shout out to uh, Pam, which I don't think she's in here right now. She's teaching. Look at that. Look at that. Um, so shout out to Pam and uh, the rest of the ladies on the on the women's board for our women's ministry. They put so much passion and, and planning into all these women events, and uh, they did a phenomenal job. So let's give it up for them. 
And then, of course, I've got to give a shout out to my wife who brought the message yesterday. And I've heard some great. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> I didn't get to hear it, uh, but I've heard that just great testimonies of all that God did with our women yesterday. And then lastly, here on Mother's Day, we are going to start the uh, Change for Life campaign with the Crisis Pregnancy Center. And um, out at the table in our uh, foyer, we have a bunch of these bottles that have a little slit right here for you to uh, put change in. And we ask from Mother's Day to Father's Day for you to take these, to fill them up with change and to return them. And then all of the money raised is going to go straight into the Crisis Pregnancy Center. So make sure to grab one of these today. Who wants this one? Who wants this one? All right. right, My mom wanted it. She was first. And all right. Hopefully the Pacers can catch passes like that later. All right. So make sure to grab one of those today. But one of the uh, greatest feelings in the world is when you've worked at a toxic job, you find a new job, and you're able to tell that toxic job, I quit. And I've personally been there. Uh, some of you have heard the story, but I was on staff at a uh, really uh, toxic church. Uh, the church itself wasn't toxic, but the leadership was toxic uh, a handful of years ago, and I was miserable, and I did not know uh, what I was going to do, but God miraculously opened the door for me to get hired at another church that was not toxic, and I've got to say, I'm just going to be honest. I'm going to keep it real with you all today. Um, turning in my resignation to an extremely toxic pastor was one of the greatest feelings in the world, okay? Um, I'm, not, I'm not lying to you. And I'm sure that many of you have had that feeling as well. <clears throat> there are moments where when quitting certain things feels really good. And not all quitting is bad. Uh, it is a good thing for someone that has been addicted to cigarettes to, to be able to quit cigarettes and to stop smoking. It's a good thing when an unhealthy person makes changes and quits doing the old habits that cause them to be unhealthy. And like my story, it's a good thing to quit a toxic job and to walk into the next thing that God has for you. And it's important to know that not all quitting is bad, but there are moments when people have been labeled as quote unquote quitters in a negative way, especially in the sports world. I remember back in 2010 when LeBron James chose to leave the Cleveland Cavaliers and to join the Miami Heat. And LeBron was born and raised in Cleveland. He played high school basketball in Cleveland. And it so happened that the year that he got drafted, the Cleveland Cavaliers had the first pick of the NBA draft. And Cleveland was able to draft their homegrown hero, LeBron James. It was a story that only seemed possible in a movie. But in 2010, LeBron announced that he would be leaving Cleveland to join the Miami Heat. And when he announced that he was leaving Cleveland, he, he chose to turn the announcement into a primetime television event. And he left all Cleveland fans and, and management going into this interview, had no idea what he was going to decide to do. And on the primetime television event, he said the now famous line of, I'm taking my talents to South Beach. And the fans of Cleveland were not happy at all. Uh, LeBron was unable to win a championship in his first seven years in Cleveland, and many people instantly labeled him as a quitter in a very negative way, saying that he quit on his hometown, that he quit on the fans of Cleveland. And many people to this day still call LeBron James a quitter. And I am not a LeBron fan by any means, uh, but he did come back to Cleveland and win Cleveland a championship. And I heard that. And, and we can all have our opinion Uh, on situations like with LeBron, but in each of our personal lives, there are moments where all of us have wanted to quit things that we should not want to quit. We've all been tempted to be quitters. Today is Mother's Day. And for the moms in here, there are days, countless days, where motherhood is hard. There are days where you just want to leave your kids and just quit because the kids are being so difficult. And that, when they're toddlers all the way up to when they're grown adults, you still have those days. To all the married folks in here, there are days where marriage is hard. There are days where our emotions get the best of us and we say and we do things that we regret. And even if we don't have the biblical grounds for divorce, 
but you want to throw in the towel and to just quit. And then on the journey of our Christian faith, there are moments where we often encounter trials and challenges that test the very core of our beliefs. There are moments when the path seems daunting and the burdens we carry weigh heavily upon us. And it is in these moments that we face the temptation to throw up the white flag and to quit. Yet as Christians, we are called to a different standard. We are called to perseverance, to enduring faith that stands firm in the face of adversity. And we're in the middle of our verse-by-verse expedition through the book of Acts. And uh, we are going to be finishing chapter 5 today. And um, through this study, we are seeing uh, the early church of Jesus Christ began and how it should motivate us to be a church that gets after it and to be a church in motion. Today, we're diving into Acts 5, 33 through 42. And last week, we finished with the apostles uh, being brought back to the Sanhedrin after the angel helped them escape prison. And they went back to preaching in the temple. And we finished with Peter preaching the gospel to the Sanhedrin, which were the 70 Jewish leaders. And today, what we're going to see is that the apostles had a quote-unquote, quote, no quit mentality, even though they were facing many things that could have caused them to want to throw up the white flag. And what we will learn today is that as we get after it for the expanding of the kingdom of God, quitting on our journey of faith is not an option. And this is our big idea for today. True followers of Jesus are not quitters. And one question before we dive in. Do you ever get tempted to quit on this journey of faith when things get difficult? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. God, we thank you just for all that you're doing at this gathering today, Lord. We thank you that we got to worship you. God, we thank you that children were dedicated to you, Lord. God, we thank you that we get to study your word together. God, we thank you that we get to spend time of prayer together. And then after time of fellowship, Lord, and God, I just pray that you would be with us today as we dive into your word. Holy Spirit, guide us to the truth of this word. And may we not just hear this word, but may we put this word in action and let us be a light in the world. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so we're going to dive back into verse 33 of chapter 5 of Acts. When they heard this, they were in rage and wanted to kill them. Welcome to church. So remember, last week uh, ended with Peter and the apostles preaching the gospel to the Sanhedrin, the Jewish leaders and council. And Peter, Peter was pretty blunt. Peter told them that we as the apostles, we are going to obey God rather than you. And then uh, the apostles told, uh, told the Sanhedrin that they were the ones that murdered Jesus, who was the Son of God and the Messiah. And then Peter was pleading for the Sanhedrin to repent. And after the Sanhedrin heard the gospel presentation, they were enraged and wanted to kill them. Unable to handle the apostles stealing their religious thunder, they were about to erupt like a volcano with a bad case of heartburn. And to the Sanhedrin, the idea of the apostles defying their orders and challenging their authority was absolutely intolerable to them. They were the definition of toxic leaders. And I'm sure that the thoughts in their minds were things such as, who are these fishermen turned preacher to tell us the highest religious council to repent? Like, do you even know who we are? But after all these repeated encounters with the Sanhedrin, the apostles refused to water down their message. They were not willing to compromise. And this is a good reminder for us. We cannot quit preaching the truth despite whatever may happen to us. And we've talked about this point a couple of times so far for the, through the first chapter five, or the first five chapters of Acts. But no matter the threats, no matter the intimidation, and no matter how upset people may get, we cannot quit preaching the truth. In our lives as Christians, we often encounter situations where our faith is challenged and we may feel pressure to conform to social norms or to compromise our beliefs to avoid conflict. We may feel the pressure to water down the truth of the gospel. 
But what we are seeing with the apostles in our passage today should remind us that we must stand firm in our convictions, even in the face of opposition or persecution. We must have the same no-quit mentality as the apostles. We must continue to preach the full truth of the gospel. We cannot quit and say we're taking our talents to South Beach. But we cannot quit preaching that there is only one way to heaven and that it is through Jesus Christ. We cannot preach, quit preaching that whatever this book right here calls as a sin is a sin and we must flee from it. And despite whatever our society tries to force upon us, if it contradicts the word of God right here, we cannot quit opposing what they are trying to force upon us. And society may try to force us, but we will not quit and we will not conform. The truth that we preach may enrage those around us, but we will not quit and we will not conform. And with the apostles today, the Sanhedrin were enraged and wanted to kill them. The the religious leaders were ready to unleash their inner religious hulk and smash the pesky apostles. But I love this quote by Leonard Ravenhill. He said, if Jesus preached the same message ministers preach today, he would have never been crucified. And remember, these leaders that the apostles enraged, they were the very same people that had Jesus murdered. So if they had been willing to murder Jesus, then how much more were they prepared to kill the stubborn followers of Jesus? And although we've seen the Sanhedrin annoyed with the apostles a handful of times so far, through the first five chapters of Acts, this is the first time where we see that their heart's desire is to have them killed. They're learning that no threats are going to stop the early church from preaching the gospel. So all they can think to do is to do what they did with Jesus, to have them killed. And let's reread verse 34. But a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law who was respected by all the people, stood up in the Sanhedrin and ordered the men to be taken outside for a little while. So here we see a Pharisee named Gamaliel. uh, And he stood up amongst his fellow members of the Sanhedrin, and and he used his voice, and he was a teacher of the law, and he was also respected by all the people. So amongst the Sanhedrin, you had the Sadducees, which we've talked about a couple of times so far through our expedition of Acts, and the, the Sadducees didn't believe in miracles or angels, or the resurrection, but then there were also the Pharisees. And the Pharisees, they did believe in the resurrection, but most of them did not believe that Jesus was the Messiah. We will see here uh, possibly next week that there were people of the Sanhedrin that did convert to faith in Christ, but the Pharisees were the ones that gave Jesus a lot of problems when Jesus was on earth. They, They were the strict enforcers of the Mosaic law on the Jews, but they would enforce it, but they themselves didn't follow it fully. And this person that we see in our passage today, Gamaliel, he was one of the most respected Pharisee leaders of his time. And this council of the Sanhedrin is sort of as a, it's, it's kind of like if Baptists and Pentecostals came on a council together, okay? And, and Gamaliel wasn't just any Pharisee, right? He was the Pharisee. And a fun little fact later in Acts 22, we see the Apostle Paul, after his conversion, say that he studied under Gamaliel before he converted to Christianity. But what we're seeing with Gamaliel is that he's attempting to be the voice of reason amongst the Sanhedrin. And all of us need someone in our life that is a voice of reason. I know I do. When I was preparing this sermon, I was trying to think of a particular time when the voice of reason in my life, who of course is my wife, has been that voice of reason. And and I asked her, I said, Madison, can you think of a particular time when you were the voice of reason in my life? And she looked at me all the time. And I agree. I I agree 100%. But I did think of a particular time. And it was a time when we lived in Whiteland and we would always go to, to Costco. And there was one day where we walked into Costco and as we were walking, I looked over to the left, and it's as if as what I saw had a light from heaven radiating on it. It was incredible. And I wanted to buy it right then and there. 
I didn't care what the price was. I wanted it. It was this right here. It was the NFL Blitz arcade machine. If, if, if I was a 90s kid growing up playing the 64, and NFL Blitz is the greatest football game ever made. And my friends and I would stay up late playing this game all the time. I loved this game. And when I was looking at it, I just imagined my boys and I like having tournaments and playing it all the time. Um, it, 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 but, but at that moment in Costco, my wife was the voice of reason. She said, Josh, you don't need that. You don't even have the time to play that. And then also, we don't even have the room in our house for that. And also, we don't need to spend money, that kind of money right now, on an arcade machine. And as much as I didn't want to hear it, my wife, who was the voice of reason, was right. But I will say, however, in our home now, we do have the room for it, okay? <laughs> we're, we're about to see Gamaliel attempt to be the voice of reason with the Sanhedrin. And, and amidst the Sanhedrin, he stood up and he ordered the apostles to be taken outside for a little while. And this act of removing the apostles from the immediate situation allows Gamaliel to address the Sanhedrin without the potential influence of the apostles' presence. And as we said a few weeks ago, we saw uh, where the apostles were taken out of the presence of the Sanhedrin. And you may ask, well, how did the author of Acts, Luke, get this information of what happened amongst the Sanhedrin? Well, again, we're going to see here soon that there were people on this religious council, the Sanhedrin, that converted to faith. So it's safe to assume that they were the ones that gave the testimony of what happened amongst the Sanhedrin. So let's reread verse 35. He said to them, men of Israel, be careful about what you're about to do to these men. So here we see Gamaliel begin his address by saying, men of Israel. And this shows a sign of humility from Gamaliel. He's starting off on the right foot. And he begins the urge he begins to urge the members of the Sanhedrin to be careful with what they intend to do to the apostles. Remember, he was very respected and his words carried a lot of weight. This is as if Janet Leatherman were to come up and to say something to the church, like we're going to respect what Miss Janet says. Uh, and there's a lot that we can learn from this verse. This verse shows us the significance of using wisdom when making decisions. We can't always just rush into a decision, especially when we're angry and maybe even a little hangry like those in the Sanhedrin. And they were ready to kill the apostles. And Gamaliel steps in and he's like, whoa, 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 whoa. Like, let's just chill for a second. Let's take some time to think about what you're going to do. And in the meantime, here's a Snickers. You're not acting like yourself, okay? Okay. But Gamaliel is encouraging the Sanhedrin to take a step back and to carefully evaluate the situation before taking action, recognizing the potential consequences of their decisions. And this is the case for us. Making a wise decision consists of patience, thoughtful consideration, and not quickly rushing into a decision. I can say that some of the worst decisions I've ever made are the decisions that I rushed into. When Madison and I bought our first car after getting married, married, I rushed into that and I paid for that for years. And Proverbs 3, 5 through 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not rely on your own understanding. In all your ways know Him and He will make your paths straight. So when we make decisions, we should look to God's Word. We should pray for guidance. We should reach out to a voice of reason in our lives that will give us wisdom. We should take the time to weigh the options carefully and we should consider the potential impact of our actions. So if you're angry at your job, like the Sanhedrin were mad at the apostles, it is wise not to just angrily walk out of your job and quit, okay? Take a moment to pause, breathe, go to the word of God and prayer for guidance. Call someone in your life that can be a voice of reason and give you wisdom. Don't call the friend that never pushes back and just says, no, no, yeah, you need to walk out right now. Call the voice that will be a voice of reason. Weigh your options carefully and consider the impact of your decisions. Because if you walk out, you won't have a job and you won't have income coming in to pay those bills. So use wisdom in your decision-making. 
And we see Gamaliel stepping in and urging the Sanhedrin to not rashly rush into a decision, but to use wisdom and to thoughtfully consider what they're about to do. So ask yourselves, am I wisely making decisions? Let's go ahead and dive back into verse 36. Some time ago, Theudas rose up, claiming to be somebody, and a group of about 400 men rallied to him. He was killed, and all his followers were dispersed and came to nothing. So now here in verse 36, we continue to see Gamaliel to attempt to be the voice of reason. And I would say that his advice in verse 35 was good advice, and there are things that we can learn from his advice. But now he starts to do a few things that are just a little off. In the next few verses, we see Gamaliel compare Jesus to two Jewish rebels. And this shows us that to Gamaliel, Jesus was just another zealous Jew trying to set the nation free from Rome. And here in verse 36, we see uh, Gamaliel comparing Jesus, Jesus to Theudas. And this Theudas rose up claiming to be somebody and a group of about 400 men rallied to him. He was killed and all his followers were dispersed and came to nothing. So this Theudas claimed to be somebody. And this is why Gamaliel is using him as a comparison to Jesus because Jesus did claim to be somebody. He claimed that he was the Messiah, but he was the Messiah. And, and this Theudas only gained about 400 men that rallied to him. Yet here at this point in chapter five of Acts, the early true church grew well over 10,000 people by this point. And then we see Theudas was killed and all of his followers were dispersed and came to nothing. And I wish that like, I could have just talked to Gamaliel here. Like, bro, I appreciate you trying to be the voice of reason here, but this is not a very good comparison, my man, because Jesus may have been killed like Theudas, but Jesus rose from the grave and you have people right here that witnessed it. And these followers of Jesus, unlike the followers of Theudas, they won't quit even though you are trying to silence them. And the faith of Christianity is definitely becoming something because thousands upon thousands are beginning to follow the teaching of Jesus from these apostles. So if you ask me, oh Gamaliel, this is like comparing apples to oranges. Completely different. Let's reread verse 37. After this man... Judas the Galilean rose up in the days of the census and attracted a following. He also perished and all his followers were scattered. So Gamaliel finished his, ex his example of Theudas and now he shares about another Jewish rebel whose name was Judas. And this was not the same Judas that betrayed Jesus. But like Theudas, this Judas rose up in the days of the census and attracted a following. And historians say that Judas led a rebellion against Roman taxation during the census conducted under Chirinius, the Roman governor of Syria, and his uprising like that of Theudas was a response to the oppressive policies of Roman rule and the burden of taxation imposed on the Jewish people. But just like Theudas, Judas also perished and all of his followers were scattered. And again, not a very good example because the followers of Jesus aren't just vanishing. They're continuing to multiply. But there is some practical wisdom and teaching for us in this verse. Christians should be cautious not to place undue trust in human leaders or movements. We must recognize their limit, limitations and susceptibility to failure. We talked about authority last week, and we talked about all authority established by God. However, we should not place full trust in human leaders. Human leaders are not God. And these human leaders have limitations. These leaders can easily fail. Listen, every single president is susceptible to failing. Politicians will fail. Kings will fail. And the same goes for movements. So many people jump on board with these movements that rise up, but quite often, just like with the movements that, we, that started with the Judas and Judas, these movements end in failure. And we can all think of human movements that have come tumbling down in our lives. But there is one leader that we can put our trust in, 
and that leader is Jesus. And there is one movement that we can be completely dedicated to, and that movement is his church. And Jesus must always remain the ultimate leader of the church. And the word of God must always be the guide for the church. If, pro- if quote unquote prophets or quote unquote apostolic leaders rise up and share that they have a word from God for the church, but that word does not line up with God's word, we should not follow that message. And then when, the, when, when we look to Jesus as our ultimate leader and we depend on his word for guidance and we keep the same no quit attitude as the early church that we're seeing in the passage today, the movement of the church will be a movement that cannot and will not be stopped. And I don't know about you, but I refuse to put my trust into a human leader or a human movement. They will eventually fail, just like the movements of Theudas and Judas. And they may not fail until Christ returns, but I choose to put my trust in Jesus. And I choose to remain committed to His movement being the church. And I am determined and I am hope, and I hope today that you will be determined that we will not quit the mission that he has called us to. What movement will you be committed to? Will you be committed to a social movement or the church? Will you be committed to a political party or the church? What movement will you be committed to? So Gamaliel, this man was attempting to be this voice of reason. He compared Jesus and this movement of his followers to these movements from these two Jewish rebels. And then he continued, let's go back to verse 38. So in the present case, I tell you, stay away from these men and leave them alone. For if this plan or this work is of human origin, it will fail. So here in verse 38, I would say, Gamaliel's advice is half right, but it's half wrong. He's been attempting to be this voice of reason, and he's compared this Jesus movement to the movement of these former former Jewish rebels. And now he's telling the Sanhedrin to stay away from these men and leave them alone. But he finished with, for if this plan or this work is of human origin, it will fail. Now, as we just discussed in verse 37, All human-made movements will eventually fail. In the end, they will fail. But there are plenty of human-made movements that have been inspired by Satan and have since seen success here on earth. For example, Islam is not of God, and it has not failed yet, but it has been around for centuries, and it is continuing to spread rapidly. And the quote-unquote experts say that Islam will take over as the largest religion in the world by 2050. You see, false cults often grow faster than the church. And another example, the LGBT movement has seen such success in our nation, and it is continuing to spread rapidly. And God help us, but we're about to enter into to Pride Month. And we have seen some churches welcome the ideology of this movement. But it's important to know this, success is no test of truth. There are many movements that may be considered successful in the sight of man, but are against God's truth. And in the end, God's truth will be victorious. In the end, human leaders and movements will ultimately fail. But until that day, contrary to what Gamaliel is saying in verse 38, evil may succeed. Corrupt leaders may succeed. Cults will grow. Even if things are not of God, they may temporarily see success. And it's an important reminder for us that we cannot use what the earth would call success as a measure of if something is true or not. There are many false prophets that have financial wealth, that have large followings, and they continue to reach out to the masses, but that does not mean that they are of God because they are seeing worldly success. There are many churches out there, denominations that preach absolute heresy, but they are continuing to grow and see what many people would call success. But that does not mean that they are of God. 
But according to the advice of Gamaliel, if something is of human origin, it will fail. And while that is partially true, because things that are of human origin will fail in the end, it does not mean that they won't see seasons of what many people would call success. So just just some wisdom for all of us, just a reminder for all of us. We can never use success as a measure for truth, okay? Let's reread verse 39. But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. You may even be found fighting against God. And they, being the Sanhedrin, were persuaded by him. Now, this is a statement from Gamaliel that I can get behind, okay? And although the church of Jesus Christ may be attacked from every side, and though people may oppose it, and though there may be churches that preach heresy, the true church of Jesus Christ will not fail because the church of Jesus Christ is of God. It is the only movement on the face of the earth that has an absolute, unconditioned guarantee for its future future success. Not every church or church member, but the true church of Christ will always be victorious. And it cannot be stopped by anything or anyone. And Gamaliel was wise in saying to the Sanhedrin, if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. You may be even found fighting against God. Nothing will overthrow Christ's church. Nothing will stop this movement. And those that oppose the church are attempting to fight against God. So when, when, when things continue to rise up and movements continue to rise up to try to fight against the true church of Jesus Christ, Do not worry. Do not get fearful. We have the absolute guaranteed, unconditioned promise from God that the church of Jesus Christ will see through the end. And this is what, uh, Gamaliel, he he was implying to the Sanhedrin that they, that if, that, that they may be attempting to oppose God. He's like, listen, guys, either this Jesus movement is going to come to a halt and the people are going to disperse, or we're in the wrong, and this is actually a movement started from God. And if that's the case, which it was, then we are donezo. But the heart of his advice was neutrality. Gamaliel was just sitting on the fence. And dealing with people that continually sit on the fence drives me insane. I once had a boss that with everything they did, they would just sit on the fence. Like, like, like they, they would always remain neutral, which is fine. It's good times to remain neutral. But with everything, they would remain neutral. And I mean everything. They would not pick a side. They could never come to a decision. And them doing this would always drag things on. Has anyone ever been there before? But Gamaliel is essentially telling his fellow Sanhedrin that they should just wait and see if Jesus and the apostles were really from God. But what greater testimony... Did he need to choose a side? They have people who witnessed the resurrection of Jesus right in their midst. These same people, being the apostles, have performed absolutely insane miracles. But Gamaliel is continuing to encourage the Sanhedrin to take a wait-and-see attitude. But Jesus made it clear that it is impossible to be neutral about him and his message. Matthew 12, 30 said, anyone who is not with me is against me. And anyone who does not gather with me scatters. Gamaliel was not truly for the Lord. You cannot remain neutral when it comes to Christ. And what some, what, what some men would call caution, God would call cowardice. The apostles were true ambassadors and Gamaliel, he was only a religious politician. And when it comes to Jesus, Do not sit on the fence. Choose a side. And this verse ended with, they were persuaded by him. So the Sanhedrin agreed to follow his advice. And now for these final three verses of our passage today, we're going to get to the meat of how the apostles in the early church had a no-quit mentality. So let's dive back in to verse 40. After they called in the apostles and had them flogged, they ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus and release them. So, Here in verse 40, we see the Sanhedrin call in the apostles, and what did they do? They had them flogged. Now remember, 
They were so enraged in verse 33 that they wanted to have the apostles killed. But they partially listened to Gamaliel's attempt to be a voice of reason. And instead of killing them, they had them flogged. And when people refuse to deal with disagreements on the basis of principle and truth, they often resort to verbal or physical violence and sometimes both. And here we see the Sanhedrin resort to physical violence. And flogging was no joke. This was the Jewish punishment of 40 lashes, less one. So each apostle was beat with a whip 39 times. There were people that actually died from flogging. And this was meant to be a serious lesson for the offenders. And Jesus warned the apostles of this in the Gospels. Jesus told them in Matthew 10, 17, beware of them because they will hand you over to the local courts and flog you in their synagogue. So this is not something that people would want to have to endure again. This is something that would cause most people to quit the things that they were doing that got them punished. And what got them punished was continuing to preach the name of Jesus. And now look at what the Sanhedrin said to them. They ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus and release them. Do you ever hear things that cause you to just want to do a face palm? Like there's a lot of things that I see people post on Facebook and it just causes me to want to go... And when I read this from the apostles, it causes me to just, like, instead of acknowledging that Jesus was the Messiah and that it was God's work amongst the apostles and the early church, they decided to once again do what they already did multiple times before. Um, Yeah, guys, I know we've said this before. And we know the sick are being healed and we know the lame have begun to walk and we know that people's lives are being changed by the message that you're preaching. But yeah, we're, we're, uh, we're going to need you to stop preaching that name of Jesus. This is like the third time they've told them this. And do you think the apostles are going to quit? Do you think this is going to cause them to stop? Let's go to verse 41. Then they went out from the presence of the Sanhedrin rejoicing that they were counted worthy to be treated shamefully on behalf of the name. If that doesn't convict you right there, wow. The apostles left the presence of the Sanhedrin. And what were they doing? After being in prison, after being flogged, after almost getting killed, they rejoice that they were counted worthy to be treated shamefully on behalf of the name. They were rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name of Jesus. And they did not complain. They did not ask God to make things easier for them. They did not get bitter. They didn't walk away with the face of defeat like we see with LeBron James all the time when he doesn't get his way. They didn't walk away wanting to quit this journey of faith. No, they rejoiced. And Peter later wrote in 1 Peter 4, 12 through 13, Dear friends, don't be surprised when the fiery ordeal comes among you to test you as if something unusual were happening to you. Instead, Everyone say, rejoice as you share in the sufferings of Christ so that you may also rejoice with great joy when his glory is revealed. Friends, suffering for the name of Jesus is not a burden to be endured, but a privilege to be embraced. When we suffer for Christ, it is a sign of our identification with Christ and participation in his sufferings. And rather, than viewing suffering as something to be avoided or endured. And rather than wanting to quit when things get hard, we are called to be like the apostles and to embrace it as an opportunity to demonstrate our true allegiance to Jesus Christ. R.C. Sproul once said, there is no higher honor or glory for a human being than to receive on this planet than that of partaking in the humiliation of Christ. And what a comfort this passage must be to the the suffering Christians in places like North Korea and Syria and and China and so many other places that remain hostile to the gospel. And it should be a great encouragement to anyone that continues to be mocked, shamed, intimidated uh, here in our own nation for standing up for what they believe. And if you find yourself suffering as a Christian like the apostles, don't throw up the white towel and quit. No, rejoice. You are in good company. Why? because we will never regret having suffered for the name. And this final uh, verse of our passage today, we're going to see that the apostles did not quit 
when things got hard. So let's go to our last verse, verse 42. Every day in the temple and in various homes, they continued teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. So despite the imprisonment, despite the intimidation, despite the flogging, despite being told to stop preaching the name of Jesus, despite all the suffering that the apostles were enduring, they would not quit. They were like Rocky Balboa. No punch was going to keep them down. And everywhere they went, whether in the temple or in people's homes, they continued teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. And the early Christians did not allow obstacles or threats to deter them from getting after it for the expanding of the kingdom of God. They remained steadfast in their commitment to teaching and proclaiming the gospel day after day. When people called them names, they did not quit. When things got uncomfortable, they did not quit. When things got difficult, they did not quit. When people opposed them, they did not quit. And when they were legitimately persecuted, they did not quit. And this should challenge each of us in this room today. They, they continued the mission where many would have quit. And so often for many of us, we will allow such small things to be enough to keep us silent and sharing of the gospel. Or we'll allow these small things to stop us from doing what God has called us to do. And, and what are the things that are causing you to maybe want to quit? Is it the opinion of others? Is it a lack of true commitment? Are you surrounded by people that are bringing you down instead of encouraging you in the ways of the Lord? And we often allow such small threats to be enough to throw in the towel and to walk away from this walk with Christ. And we must have the same courage as the apostles. We must have the same determination to stand firm for the gospel. So friends, let's not be quitters when things get difficult. In a world filled with so many challenges and obstacles, the call to follow Christ is not always the easy path. Yet, as followers of Jesus, we are not called to quit. We are called to persevere in our faith journey. And we're called to persevere even faced with adversity. And despite facing opposition and persecution, the early church remained steadfast in their dedication for living for Jesus. And likewise, in our own lives, we are called to press on with determination and courage, trusting in God's strength to sustain us. Remember our big idea, true followers of Jesus are not quitters. And as you stand to your feet, let us not grow weary or discouraged, but instead, let us continue to stand firm in our faith, knowing that our labor in the Lord is never in vain. The Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15.58, Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, be steadfast, immovable, always excelling in the Lord's work, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. So will you quit your journey of faith when things get hard? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, I pray for each person in this room today that um, is not saved, Lord that has not repented, that has not turned to you in faith to be saved. And God, I pray that you would call them unto you today. And God, I pray, Lord, that they would uh, just talk with you today, Lord, that they would repent of their sins, meaning they are they're desiring for you to help them turn away from the sin in their lives, Lord. And God, I pray in each of our hearts that you would reveal any sin in our lives that we need to repent of today. And God, I pray that each person would ask for forgiveness and declare that Christ is Lord. God, I pray for all the moms with us today. God, thank you for this beautiful Mother's Day. And God, I pray that you would continue to give each mom strength through whatever season of motherhood they may be in, Lord. And God, I pray that as we get after it, that we would not quit on this journey of faith, even when things get difficult. God, that we would not quit preaching the truth despite whatever may happen to us. And God, I pray that when we make decisions, that we would be patient, that we would take thoughtful consideration and not quickly rush into a decision. And Lord, I pray that we would be cautious not to place undue trust in human leaders or movements, O oh Lord. And God, I pray that we would put our trust in Jesus and be committed to this movement, your movement, the church. And God, I pray that we would not look at success as a test of truth, 
God, I pray that we would not be like Gamaliel and be neutral about Jesus and his message. And God, I pray that we would not look at suffering for the name of Jesus as a burden to be endured, but God as a privilege to be embraced. And Lord, I pray that as followers of Jesus, that we would not quit and that we would persevere in our faith journey. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, that wraps up our sermon this week. We hope that you enjoyed. If you're in need of prayer, you can email me at pastor at christcommunitychurch.org. Make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel, like us on Facebook, and follow us on Instagram at mycccbrazil. We pray that you have a great week.